that I had a thousand voices to praise my God with thousand tongues. My heart, which in the Lord rejoices, would then proclaim in grateful songs to all wherever I might be what great things God has done for me. You forest leaves so green and tender that dance for joy in summer air. You meadow grasses bright and slender, you flowers so fragrant and so fair. You live to show God's praise alone. Join me to make his glory known. All creatures that have breath and motion, that throng the earth, the sea, the sky, come share with me my heart's devotion. Help me to sing God's praises high. My utmost powers can never quite declare the wonders of His might. Well, good morning to all of you and a happy Father's Day. Yep, that is. Hi, I'm Pastor Paul, and glad to lead us in this time with God here this day as we continue our series on God's one another people. The reason we gather is to honor our the best father of all, God our Father. Won't you join me as we make our beginning? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving God, we come on this Father's Day reminded that you are the Father of us all. You have been with us from our birth, guiding, nurturing, and sustaining us. Father God, we praise you. You've taught us and brought us to maturity, always concerned for our welfare, constantly seeking the best for us. Father God, we praise you. Whenever we have needed you, you have been there, willing to listen and advise. Father God, we praise you. You have called us into your family, a people united through your son, Jesus Christ. And through him, you have revealed your love, a love that reaches out to us day by day, despite our failure to love you in return. Father God, we praise you. Teach us to live as your children, to hear your voice, obey your instruction, and respond to your goodness. Father God, we praise you. Teach us to bear your name with pride, to share with others through word and deed the joy that you have given us. Father God, we praise you. And finally, receive our thanks for the fathers that you've given us, the earthly ones. All they have meant to us, all they have given us, and all they have done in so many ways. Father God, we praise you in the name of Christ. Amen. of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone, cause you're a good, good father, it's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers, far and wide, but I 
searching for answers Only you provide Cause you know just what we need Before we can say a word You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am God is perfect in all his ways to us, but we not so much. But recognizing that, we come before the Lord, confessing our imperfections to our perfect God. Let's pray. Oh God, Father that you are, you know what is right for us, but we too often, well, we want only what is our way or no way instead of your way. Have mercy on us, please, when we turn from you. Forgive us when we do not realize your fatherly love and direction for us. Have mercy upon us indeed and teach us anew how to follow you, Father, that you are. We pray this through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Having heard our confession on God's behalf, I speak these words. The Lord is like a father to us compassionate and merciful, filled with endless love. He is not easily angered, nor does he remain angry forever. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve or punish us harshly as he could, as we deserve. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so strong is his love toward us. And as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us. So be at peace. You are at peace. You are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's sing. Try to find the words, put them in a song. How can I describe a gift from above? This is his love. 
Live another day following your way Help me realize that you are enough This is his love So high like a mountain So big is your love Wide as the ocean How deep is your love It's bright as a mountain Star, it's warm as the sun. This is his love. This is his love. This is his love. Try to find the words, put them in a song. In your grace, we trust and honor your. sweet message that is what a sweet god we have and thanks uh, mike for writing that song and olivia and uh ha hallie for bringing that to us we appreciate it uh, i want to share with you god's word and our first passage comes from colossians chapter 3 it's kind of the basis of the message that we have before us today let the peace of christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful let the message of christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Our second scripture reading you know, it comes from the lips of Jesus, as recorded by Luke in chapter 17 of his gospel. It goes like this. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them, even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. It's the gospel of the Lord. It's time for our children's message. So kids gather around. Uh, Mrs. Joyce Shanchek is going to share it with us. Joyce. Thank you, Pastor Mike. 
Good morning. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Hi, boys and girls, Mrs. Shanshek here, and I thought it was such a beautiful day, we would come outside to have a little chat. Do you know where I learned that song? I learned that song in Sunday school. And do you know where I went to Sunday school? Right here at St. Matthew. Yep, I was six years old and my Sunday school teacher taught me that song. I've remembered it for a long time and it's a great song because it reminds me we always need to be careful what we see, what we think, or what we say. Because the Bible says, and the Bible is God's word, Whatever you do by word or by deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. Let's talk about the part of the song that is, be careful little mouth what you say. Oh, be careful little mouth what you say. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful little mouth what you say. I was hoping you could help me figure out something. Our words, our talking that come out of our mouth, sometimes they can be happy and sometimes they can be grumpy. So I was hoping you would help me figure out which of these words are happy and which of these words are grumpy. Okay, here we go. Where did you get that weird old sweater? Yeah, that's a grumpy one, isn't it? But did you know there's another way to say that? You look nice today. Where did you get that sweater? That's not grumpy, that's happy. How about this one? That job you're doing is so easy, you must be a wimp if you can do it. Yeah, grumpy. How about this way? May I help you with that job? It's always easier when two people work together. Mm-hmm, that sounds so much better. And here's the last one. Go away and leave me alone. Definitely this one. May I please be alone for a while? Can I talk to you later? Much more pleasant. Mm-hmm. Thanks for helping me figure that out. Having your feelings hurt is not the way you want to be treated. Let's remember how you would feel when someone hurts you badly. Who's the only perfect person there ever was? Do you know? Jesus, our friend Jesus. He never did anything wrong. Uh-uh. That's right. That means that you or me are not perfect. And sometimes happy and kind people say things very grumpy. They say things that they shouldn't. So the question is, what do we do when we do that? We ask God for forgiveness, and then we go and apologize to whoever we talk to, and we hurt. How about if we say a prayer right now and ask God to help us be happy and help us talk the way Jesus wants us to talk? All right, I'm ready to pray. Are you? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your, our wonderful bodies that you created. Help us to think before we speak and not to use our words or to hurt others. Help us use our tongues to encourage each other and tell others about Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for stopping by, and you have a wonderful day. Remember to say some happy, wonderful things.
Boy, thanks, uh, Mike and Susie, for that, and uh, Joyce for the children's message prior to that. That is good. And again, uh, happy Father's Day to uh, all the fathers here among us. You know, I was talking to one of you, and you were telling me the other night there was a conversation at the dinner table when something like this, the little girl at the dinner table uh, looked up at her father and asked, Daddy, uh, you're the boss in our family, right? And the rather proud father said, well, yes, little princess, you're right. And then the girl continued. And that's because mama puts you in charge, right? <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, who's in charge? Yeah, mom and dad, right? Happy Father's Day with that one. Well, what another one of you were telling me about a you were having some problems parenting because there was a child of yours that was not obeying mom or dad, rather disobedient and kind of lazy. And finally, in frustration, that, that young one said, for 20, 20 bucks, I'll be good. The exasperated father said, oh, yeah, that's nothing. When I was your age, I was good for nothing. Huh. Okay, okay, that didn't come out like it was supposed to, did it? No. Uh, the truth is that mothers and fathers are the boss in the family. That's true. That's the God-given place that God's given you in the family. And it is true that as part of their role as uh, being the boss of the family or the, the authority in the family, and their job is to correct those things that are out of line in the lives of the kids. Uh, yeah, to right or wrong where it is happening, whether it's disobedience or anything else. And, and correcting kids is not always an easy thing. You know, the Bible says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. That word, the training and correction that is in keeping with God's word. But that's not always easy. I mean, you got to, it's kind of like walking on a, a tightrope or something. You can't, on the one hand, you can't be over stringent and over demanding in ways that would exasperate uh, the children. But on the other hand, you can't be so lenient that the kids don't have any self-control. It's just not always easy being a parent. And how much more is that so that it's not easy when the correction that is needed is needed not for your child, but for another adult? Hmm. You see, God has called his followers, all those who have come to faith, who he has given faith in Jesus. God has called us to be part of his one another family, where we're in this together, where as the Bible says, we spur one another on toward love and good deeds. That's his calling. And part of that calling can mean that at some times we are to admonish one another. Oh, that's where we're going to go here this day. It's part of this series of messages where we're taking a look at of Bible passages that use the phrase one another to learn how God designed us to be his one another people. And by the way, if you've missed any of the messages in the series, you can always watch them online at our website, st-matthew.org. Today, we're taking the main cue for this message out of the Apostle Paul's spirit-inspired letter to the Christians in Colossae. It's the same place where we looked last time we were together. 
And as I mentioned last time, the Apostle Paul was led by the Spirit to write this letter around the year 60 AD when he was under a house arrest in Rome, when a, a messenger from Colossa, the Christian church, came to the Apostle Paul some 1,200 miles to tell them that there was a false teaching that had come into the church that was impacting their lives and their life together as God's people. So the apostle begins his letter by, point, by correcting that false doctrine, pointing out the deity and the all-sufficiency all sufficiency of Jesus. And then he turns his attention to how that all-sufficiency of Jesus ought to make a difference in our lives. You can see that in the first verse of our Bible reading today, where it starts with the note, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, the peace of Christ. Now, we sang about that peace of Christ in that song a little earlier, Good, Good Father. We sang peace so unexplainable. Well, let me try to explain it a little bit. The fact of the matter is that God is our good, good, perfect father. But we haven't been perfect kids. Not a one of us. Me too. And uh, we have disobeyed our heavenly dad. And we deserve punishment as a result of that now and punishment forever as well. But God, our good, good father, loves us so that that love, as high as the mountains, as wide as the ocean, that love moved God to send his only son, Jesus Christ, into this world to take the punishment, the discipline, the consequences that we deserved so that we could be forgiven children of God. We could have a relationship a peace with God as our father and we as his forgiven children. And that peace of Christ is really a status. It's a condition. It's a state of being that you have through faith in Jesus. When God gives you faith to trust in Jesus, he gives you the status where you have peace with God, a relationship with God. Yeah. And that peace, the Bible passage says, is to rule in our hearts. It's to guide our lives. It's to influence how we live and how we live as God's one another people. But Paul takes a little step further when he writes then in verse 16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. You are to let that message of Christ's peace dwell in you richly. Uh, the peace of Christ's message is not to just show up once a week in online worship in your life or in-person worship in your life. It is to be rich in our lives more than just one hour, one day a week. And it's to be not just show up once a week in an hour of worship through a sermon. It's to show up richly in a variety of ways, including in songs, Christian music, and in teaching and admonishing one another. One of the ways we are to let this peace of Christ's word dwell richly in us, influence our lives and influence our lives together is in Christian music, but also in admonition of one another, godly admonition. Now, that's not so easily found today to the detriment of God's design for his one another people. I'll give you a couple of reasons why. There are hindrances to godly admonition in people's lives today. One of them is that our culture, it, well, it's just countercultural. It's well documented that uh, American culture compared to many other cultures in our world is been characterized as being rugged individualism. It's all about me. I have freedom to be who I want, do what I want. You've heard people probably say, you can believe what you want, you can live like you want, but just don't foist your opinions on me. In that kind of a culture, the idea of one person uh, admonishing another person, well, that's like running into a brick wall. It's just totally countercultural. Counter that's a hindrance to God's design for his one another people. Another hindrance is a biblical misunderstanding. I would suggest to you that one of the most misunderstood verses of the Bible comes from the lips of Jesus, where he says in Matthew 7, verse 1, judge not and you will not be judged. Many Christians misunderstand that to mean that they can't in any way correct another 
Christian. Well, good luck with that, parents, if you can never correct your kids. That's not what Jesus means, though. That's a misunderstanding, misinterpretation of that Bible passage. The context makes it clear that what Jesus is talking about is that we should not look at the speck, as Jesus said, in somebody else's eye when we got a log on our own. We should not look down on others when we got all kinds of problems on our own. We should not look down on others with a self-righteous, look down on you poor sinner, you, attitude. That's the wrong attitude for ever doing godly admonition. A third hindrance to godly admonition is simply not knowing how to do it or how to receive it. Now, over the years, truth is, I have received on a number of occasions criticism. Sometimes it is a signed piece, and sometimes it's an anonymous piece that has come my way. But I've noticed something in my experience with this, that sometimes people... Well, they express their concern in a way that comes across as being as if I was being attacked. Have you ever had that happen to you? And if you have, you know that is whenever you feel like attacked by somebody else's words, like in a children's message, a grumpy word that makes you feel like you've been attacked, you have a natural tendency to go on the defensive. And the problem with that is that you don't even hear what they're saying. You're just trying to defend yourself from this attack. The other person may be sharing something with you, a correction of something in your life that really is needed. It really would be helpful to you, but you can't hear it because of how it is spoken. You see how that could be a hindrance to godly admonition. One other one, and another hindrance to godly admonition is avoidance. Now, if you were with us last week, and if you missed it, I encourage you to watch it. If you weren't with us last week, we were talking about the other side of the coin here. There's two sides of the coin on this thing. And the other side of the coin we talked about last week was bearing with one another. We quoted that Bible passage from 1 Peter. Love covers a multitude of sins. We should. There are many occasions we should bear with, love cover, oh, little idiosyncrasies and things that drive it not even offend us. There are many occasions when love for a brother or sister in the faith should just cover. But then there are other occasions where there really needs to be admonition for that person's good, but we don't do it because we fear it might go bad. Or we don't do it because we've tried it before and it went bad. Why? I don't want to go there again. We just simply avoid godly admonition when it really is needed. These are, these are hindrances to godly admonition. These are hindrances to God's people being who he designed them to be. Remember, we are to spur one another on toward loving good deeds. And sometimes that involves godly admonition. And the body of Christ is where it ought to happen. The apostle Paul wrote again in verse 15, he wrote, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. We talked about that. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. Now think about this. Suppose your teeth look in the mirror one day and they happen to notice that in your teeth is a piece of lettuce from that meal that you just had. Your teeth don't know it, but I see it in the mirror and, and the eyes start thinking about it. Wow. If, if, if the teeth don't find out about that lettuce in the teeth, then other people might look at that lettuce in the teeth and they'll laugh at it, make fun of the teeth. That Oh, I hate to have that happen to the teeth. And, uh, well, it's probably not too healthy to have food stuck in your teeth. Um, and that wouldn't be healthy for the teeth. It probably wouldn't be healthy for, well, for us, the rest of the body either. So, um, well, maybe I should tell the teeth about it. For the teeth's good, well, and for the rest of our good. Now, can you understand where I'm going with this? We are all part of the body of Christ. We're part of God's one another people. And we're called to help one another, which is helping all of us to be more of what God wants us to be. That's God's design. So what is godly admonition? What is it? The word that is used here is really a compound word. It's two words put together. It's the word put and the word mind. Put it together means to put something in someone's mind, to share someone information with another. It, uh, it presupposes something is amiss. So the word means to warn or to correct, to admonish. That's what it means. 
If we avoid, or for any of those other reasons, avoid um, correcting a person, that person might not even know that they are doing something wrong, that they are uh, just like the, the lettuce that the teeth don't know about that's stuck in the teeth. They may not even know that. Have you ever had that happen? I have. You ever had somebody be mad at you and you don't know why? Their passive aggressive behavior is making it very clear they're upset with you, but you don't know what you've done wrong. You don't know what to apologize for. You don't know how to change because nobody ever shared it with you. See why it's important? To have at love covers a multitude of sins, but sometimes it really is helpful to the other person and your relationship with the other person to have a conversation like that. If you don't correct them, they they um, might really be unkind. It's really being unkind to them, uh, not letting them know that which could help them be more of what God wants them to be. It's being unkind if you don't share that with them. Being if you don't correct them, it can influence others in negative ways too. It can just be like a cancer that spreads among the people of God. The Bible puts it this way: one uh, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It can spread almost like a cancer in ways that are detrimental. And if we don't correct them when we see a wrong that is to their detriment and harm we're going to be held accountable. The Old Testament prophet Ezekiel recorded God's word to his people this way. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked man will die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. We will be accountable for not helping out a brother and sister and rescuing from the wrong that they may be ensnared in. But how do you do this godly admonition in a way that, well, it's godly? Well, there's a number of biblical passages that inform us on this. So let's go through this list. The first one is this. You start with self-examination. The Bible says this, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself or you also may be tempted. So the place is to start here. Make sure that we don't have that self-righteous, look down on the other person attitude. Do, as Jesus said, take the log out of your own eye before you start talking about the speck in somebody else's eye. Secondly, uh, the Bible says godly admonition is done with the right view of the other. The person is not an enemy. This is your brother or sister in Christ. This is someone who God gave his life for. This is a valuable person. The Bible says this way, if anyone does not obey our instruction, do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. And then have the right motive and goal. If you maybe had somebody who has uh, said something to you by way of correction, but they've said it in anger, and it, again, it sounded like an attack. Godly admonition is not something where someone is venting their anger or seeking to punish you verbally for the offense that you have given them. That is the wrong motive. Check your heart if that's where you're coming from in having this conversation. It's the wrong motive. What is the right motive? The scripture says this. Actually, the Apostle Paul in the first chapter of this Colossians book says, we proclaim Jesus admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. The goal is the spiritual maturity the goal is uh, helping that brother or sister be more of what God wants him to be, not to beat them up because you're angry because of what they've done. So, by the way, um, if you're angry, maybe you ought to cool down before you ever have a conversation like this. That's wise admonition. I'll say more about it in a minute. Because we also are to have this kind of conversation in accord with God's word. In accord with God's word, the Bible says all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So if we're going to have a correction, and it's going to be for the purpose of helping the people to be more of what God wants them to be, let's make sure that what we're correcting them about is in accord with God's word. Another one, let's do that privately. Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. Don't go talking about it to everybody else on the, on the team, everybody else at school, everybody else in the family. No, the conversation is a one-on-one. -on -one. That's where it ought to occur. Let's go on. 
because the Bible says more, be wise about how you admonish. Godly admonition is filled with wisdom. Admonish one another with all wisdom, the Bible says. There is a better time and a better way than others. Uh, not when you're all amped up with anger. Maybe not when the person is uh, coming off of, uh, well, a cold or something like that, and they're not feeling good. That's not going to be the best time for them. And uh, in person is best. Over the phone is next best. Sometimes in writing, it can be done. But in every occasion, um, re it, I found it helpful to kind of rehearse what I'm going to say so that I say it with the right attitude and the words that communicate the truth in love for the good of the other. Another one, hate the sin, but love the sinner. That's a phrase that we sometimes use. It comes out of the uh, second last book of the Bible. Be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. So uh, we don't like the wrong that is being done, but we sure like the one who has done the wrong because we're people that do wrong too. And God has loved us. So we want to love them for their good as well. Now, one, two more. One is to gently speak in love. The Bible says that very clearly. You who are spiritual, restore him gently. And elsewhere, speak the truth in love. You speak the truth, but you do it in love, not like a bull in a china shop. Finally, if someone, having spoken uh, the words of correction to someone who maybe has offended you, be ready to forgive be ready to forgive. Jesus said, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. In order for God's one another people to be all that he wants them to be, there are times where love covers a multitude of sins. And it should. But there are then times where there needs to be godly admonition. And that helps the body of Christ to not just take the lettuce out of the, out of the teeth but to help the body of Christ to be more of what God wants us to be as followers of Jesus. Does it work? Well, think of the greatest king of God's people of old, a man by the name of David, a man by the name of David who was, well, he was tempted and he fell into temptation, committing adultery with uh, a woman, a married woman, and then arranging for the murder of her husband. And he almost got away with it. He tried to cover it up. And if he had succeeded, it would have been to his spiritual detriment. And it would have not helped the people of God to have a leader who had run amok from God's perfect plan for him as a leader of God's people. The harm would have been greater still. But fortunately, there was a man of God by the name of Nathan. And that Nathan had a conversation where he corrected David. With all these kinds of ways that we've just been talking about, he gave him godly admonition. And David repented of his sin. And he was restored to the favor of the good, good father. Now, will it always work that well? Probably not. But God's plan is for his one another people to cover a, a multitude of sins with love and as needed to godly, in godly ways, to admonish. This is the word of the Lord. Having heard that word, would you join me in prayer as we not only pray about this message, but then also the requested prayers of God's people. Let's pray. Lord, um, this is a hard message because this is, we're not good at this. We're in a culture that doesn't like this kind of a thing. And, um, but you call us to. And, and we've learned today in fresh ways how if we refuse to, if we avoid it, it can actually be the de detriment of all concern in the body of Christ, including that brother or sister in Christ, who is a, who's a brother or sister, who you love, who you want the best for them. And, and we're part of being the best for them by how we speak to them. Lord, we're novices at this. Would you help us to learn how? to speak the truth in love in gentle ways for the good of others when need be. Show us, give us the wisdom to know when let love cover the multitude of sins and when we need to have godly admonition. Would you give us the wisdom to do this when it needs to be done 
in the ways that you show us to do it. Lord, we also want to lift up the concerns of your people. And today, um, we'll start with words of praise and thanksgiving. Uh, praise and thanksgiving with Terry and Dolores McGee upon the celebration of their 50th wedding anniversary. Praise be to you, Lord God, for Christian marriage that is an example to others like theirs. Your hand of blessing, well, you've been faithful in their lives all their years. Continue to watch them over them in the se this next season of life as well. Thank you, too, for, on behalf of Bonnie Papez for her successful medical procedure. We sure ask for your ongoing protection from that virus. We're glad to know that, uh, you know, cases are going down and so on and that things are opening up. But, uh, God, uh, we still pray for your protection. Help us in the transition to post-COVID worship and ministry. We're going to talk a little bit about that here at the end during our announcements. Um, God, oh, yes, too, that you would guide us in filling our staff vacancies. There are a lot of vacancies now also here at the church. Would you help us just kind of get things done, even in the vacancies, but then lead us to the ones you have in mind. We pray for brothers and sisters in Christ we won't meet till we get to heaven, who live in the country of North Korea and are struggling under persecution. Would you uh, give them your strength and perseverance? We lift before you homebound member Kathleen Swarthout and ask that you would assure her of your presence, hold her in your fatherly love. Be, speaking of fathers, would you be with the earthly fathers? Help them who are mentoring the next generation to do that in the best way, to provide godly leadership for their families. We ask too that you are, uh, we, we ask, well, I guess we pray with thanksgiving that as we celebrate as a country the end of slavery, that well, it took us a while to get that one right, but thanks for leading us as a country to do that. Be with those who struggle with illness issues, Braden Breeding and Randy Tyler, Nora Rahill, the newborn granddaughter of Doug and Kathy Abraham, uh, for Al Vernasco, the stepfather of Lynn Tubert, for Nancy, all those that are dealing with COVID. Oh, Lord, may your healing hand be upon them. And lastly, uh, we remember the family and the friends of Bob Gear who suddenly unexpectedly passed away yesterday. Regular worshiper with us over at the Wixom campus, Lord God. Um, we ask that you be with Darlene, his wife, and Justin and the rest of the family as they grieve that unexpected passing. Thanks, Lord God. He was a genuine follower of yours, sitting in heaven right now. Uh, thanks for the crown of everlasting life you've given him, but be with those who mourn his passing. Hear us now as we wrap all these things up in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, uh, today, I want to especially ask that you stick around for the announcements. Yesterday, we had a special elders meeting, or we had an elders meeting. I've got some post-pandemic worship announcements that are important for all of us to know, but I want to give those to you after our closing hymn. Right now, receive the blessing of our Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and that love of our good, good Father and the power of the Holy Spirit enable each one of us to be part of God's one another people. Amen. Let's sing.
Well, uh, guests, a special uh, thank you for joining us in worship here this day. We're glad you could be here. If you ever have any questions about your walk with Jesus, uh, and you need some guidance in that way, contact us. We'd be glad to help you out along the journey. I want to remind everybody that our online pastor-led Bible study will begin here at 1045. You're welcome to join us. The link is st-matthew.org slash Bible study. Thanks also for your financial support, whether you give it online, mail it in, however that is. We appreciate your support so that we can continue this ministry. Now, uh, I mentioned that uh, yesterday the elders uh, had a meeting in which they uh, discussed how best to transition to post-pandemic worship, especially in light of the government's uh, lifting of the mask and uh, gathering mandates this coming Tuesday. They decided that starting next Sunday, June 27, while we will continue online worship, all COVID restrictions will be lifted for our in-person worship with a couple of exceptions. One is this, we will continue for a while to still continue to distribute communion elements as people enter in bags. If you've been with us in in-person worship, you know that we then all take communion together uh, rather than coming forward to take communion. But next week uh, in our in-person worship, we'll pass around the offering plates as we've done in the past. Uh, there won't be a dismissal of everybody row by row at the end of worship and so on. There's one other thing that we're going to do, uh, continue to do. Um, and uh, just a quick story about this. A couple of weeks ago uh, in an in-person worship, when we uh, were uh, greeting people after worship, there was somebody who had just come back for the first time, had heard that we were going to go with a section that was mask optional. And this uh, mother of a young child uh, was so grateful to be back in in-person worship. Oh, it felt so good. But their little child had not of course, been able to be vaccinated. And they said to me, oh, I don't think I can come to worship if people are just going to, if masks are going to be optional. So uh, we want everybody to feel comfortable coming to worship, you know, and there are some folks who are not yet ready to come without masks and without social distancing. So in all of our in-person worship venues, on the right side, as you face the front of the church, on the right side, we will have a section where people will be asked to wear masks and they will be social distanced in their seating. Because we love all of you. We want you to feel comfortable coming to worship, whether you feel comfortable without masks and social distancing or whether you really would still yet prefer that, okay? So um, God continue to give us patience as we make this transition and come out of this thing called pandemic. Uh, we pray that that really happens completely, fully soon. With that, I want to invite you to enjoy the chat on uh, Facebook or Zoom for the next five minutes. And then we'll see you in that online Bible study. God bless. Have a great week in the Lord. Happy Father's Day.